going to call the Budget Finance Committee meeting to order. Will the Board Secretary take the roll? Mr. Jim Bard. Mr. Dwayne Burt. Here. Mr. Levi Kressler. Here. Mrs. Stephanie Eberly. Here. Dr. Nathan Goats. Here. Mr. Don Hilbinger. Here. Mr. Fred Scott. Mr. Charlie Suters. Here. Mr. Mark Butterball. Present. Dr. Suppo, are there any changes to the agenda? There are no changes to the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? Move to approve the agenda. Moved by Mr. Suters. Is there a second? Motion, uh, second. Second by Mrs. Everly. Uh, roll call. Mr. Dwayne Burt. Yes. Mr. Levi Kressler. Yes. Mrs. Stephanie Everly. Yes. Dr. Nathan Goats. Yes. Mr. Don Hilbinger. Yes. Mr. Charlie Suters. Yes. Mr. Mark Butterball. Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we'll open up for citizen comments. If there's any comments regarding the budget, uh, please come up to the microphone, state your name and address for the record. Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to the uh, local audit presentation. I'll turn it over to you, Christy. Um, one of the things on the agenda we have this evening is for um, Mrs. Tina Geip from Boyer and Ritter to present our 2021 local auditor's report. You have a hard copy of that re report in front of you. It is the big blue packet. Um, and we will then um, put this on the next board agenda for approval. I will now turn it over to Tina. I'd like to start by thanking the board for the opportunity to perform the district's audit services for last year. Also like to acknowledge Christy and Joanne and the rest of the district staff for their diligent efforts throughout the year and for their work in assisting us in preparing the audit. Our audit can be divided into two separate sections. We did a financial audit and also a compliance audit. The results of those are found in the documents you have in front of you. But within them, there's two separate reports. We'll start with a small letter first. That's called your required communications letter. <clears throat> a few items to note in here. This letter is to assist you in discharging your oversight responsibility. So the second page at the very top indicates that we had two GASB statements that were considered for implementation this year. GASB Statement 90 had no impact in your financials, however, GASB 84 did. That one changed the presentation of your student activity funds from a fiduciary fund type, which only presented a balance sheet, to now it is a governmental fund type presenting a balance sheet and a statement of revenue and expenditures. And at the bottom of that page and top of the next indicates those statements that are considered for upcoming years. The significant of those is GASB Statement 87 for leases, which will take some work to implement that for next year. <clears throat> we also want to address the accounting estimates significant to the financial statements, those being depreciation expense, net pension liability, OPEB, and your compensated absences. Significant financial statement disclosures, those being deposits and investments, capital assets, long-term obligations, defined benefit pension plan, OPEB, and your subsequent events. The next to last page of that document just goes down through. It says that we did not identify any significant accounting policies, no unusual transactions. We did make audit adjustments to the original trial balances presented to us to prepare the audit. None of those were deemed to be significant in your regular financial reporting process. This signifies that the financial data that is being presented to you on a regular basis is accurate and reliable source of information for your decision-making processes. Finally, most importantly, we did not have any disagreements with management, nor do we encounter any other issues or difficulties in performing the audit. 
Our team was provided full access to the district's records and staff as needed. Now the larger package being the actual financial report. Within this document, there are three independent auditor's reports for which we as your dis district's auditors are responsible for. The remainder of this is the district and its management's responsibility. So the first page after the table of contents, which is the third page in your document, that is the first of the independent auditor's reports, and that is the one over the financial statements as a whole. <clears throat> Indicates that we as auditors, our responsibility is to express opinions on your financial statements based on our audit. Audit standards require us to perform procedures to obtain reasonable assurance that the financial statements are free of material misstatement. To arrive at our conclusion, we perform various auditing procedures which follow an approach that focuses on materiality and risk associated with the items reported in your statements. The top of the next page <clears throat> indicates that you have received an unmodified opinion on your financial statements. This type of opinion is the highest opinion an independent auditing firm can issue. This is the type of opinion that bondholders, the federal and state government oversight agencies, and the public in general expect to see. Additionally, within this report, just to identify some things, the <clears throat> it does go through the financial statements being audited, being the basic statements and footnote disclosures. Your basic financial statements consist of your governmental activities and also the fund financial statements. Uh, the fund financial statements report the daily activity of the district's operations through various funds being your general, <clears throat> your student-sponsored activity, capital projects, and food service funds. This is equivalent to the information that Christy and her staff compile and present on a regular basis throughout the year. On the other hand, those government-wide financials reports the overall picture of the district using accounting methods similar to those used by private sector companies and those statements account for your capital assets, your long-term debt, your pension and OPEP. Just a few items is on pages four through 17 is your management discussion analysis. <laughs> this section represents management summaries of the financial positions for the fiscal year and the relevant conditions that occurred throughout the year that led to those results. Additionally, it contains comparative year-to-year -year information to give the reader additional insight into the district's financial situation. This is very valuable as the basics do not contain comparative statements. On page 17, it does kind of give you a percentage of your revenues versus expenditures over the year. And just to show that your federal and other revenue has increased significantly due to all the COVID funding. Next, moving into the government-wide financials, beginning on page 18. This is your statement in that position. <clears throat> It reports total assets of 56 million, total deferred outflows of 13, liabilities of 97 million, total deferred inflows of 3 million, and a net position of a negative 31 million. That does include your $73,000 of a liability for net pension liability and $6,000 for your OPEP. So if they were not presented, that would definitely put you in a better light. Starting on page 21 is the balance sheet for your governmental funds. This statement has cash for the student sponsored activity fund and also your fund balance for them 
Page 23 does reflect your revenues and expenditures. There is a prior period adjustment recorded in your financials this year, and that was just simply for implementation of 84 to switch the fund types. Skipping back to page 25 is your statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance. That is a general fund budget to actual. When you did your budget process last year, you budgeted for a $2 million loss. However, ultimately you ended up the year with a $30,000 to the good. Total revenues, if you go to the far right column, your variance with your final budget, total revenues came out with a, a uh, positive variance of $2.8 million. Your expenditures came out with a negative variance of 687,000, which means you spent more than 687,000, more than what you budgeted. Most of this had to do with just additions to do with the COVID budgeting. And I think Christy said that she would discuss some of these things in depth with you further when you get into the process of your budget this year. Pages 26 to 29 is the food service statements. Look at page 27, it does show that your change in net position is a $382,000 positive this year. However, if you go over to page 28, statement of cash flows, it shows that your cash actually decreased by $62,000. The reason for that being is that you were expecting federal subsidies and you're due to the general fund increased significantly over the previous year. I'm only gonna hit a couple of the footnotes Footnote number nine is on page 48. That is your long-term debt. Does show where you were at the beginning of the year. Increases being your refinancing. Decreases of $9 million of payments. So overall your fund back, or your long-term liabilities as of December, yeah, December, sorry. June 30, 2021 was $9.9 million in general obligation debt, and you owe $1,055,000 in the 21-22 school year. That debt maturities is on page 50. It shows what you owe per year for the next five years and through maturity. So by 2030, the debt at this point is satisfied. <clears throat> Flipping to page 51 does show your fund balance designations. Only just to show what the board has assigned and, and committed over where you stood as of June 30, 2021. We've also <clears throat> required reporting in accordance with uniform guidance and the government auditing standards. This is related to the second type of audit being your compliance audit or also known as a single audit. It starts on page 83. Because the district receives funding, federal funding and spent approximately $4.4 million of federal funds during the last school year were required to perform the single audit. There's two separate auditor's reports there. There's two separate sets of regu regulations we must follow, and therefore we issue separate reports for each. The first one is in accordance with government auditing standards. We're pleased to report that our testing did not identify any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies. An internal control for financial reporting, nor did we identify any non compliance material for the financial statements. Another clean opinion, an excellent result. The second report 
is two pages back. That's the one over uniform guidance. This report describes the scope of our audit relating to the federal, the major federal programs that were selected for testing. Once again, we're able to report that the district has received an unmodified opinion stating it was compliant in all material respects to federal regulations governing the major federal program. Page 87 begins what's called a schedule of findings and question cost. That's where you see that the financial statements auditor's report was unmodified, no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies. Over the federal awards, the same way, no material weaknesses, significant deficiencies, and a modified opinion. And the bottom of the page shows that we had three separate federal programs we had to audit last year based on the way the standards were written. We had to do the Education Stabilization Fund or your ESSER funds, the Coronavirus Relief Fund, and your Child Nutrition Fund. Takes to the end of the financial statements. If you have any questions or comments, you can do them now. If you want to look at them and touch base with Christy after the fact, we will be glad to answer anything that you may have. Any questions? Tina, thank you very much for the presentation. Much appreciated. And again, if, uh, after reviewing any materials, if you have any questions, get those to Christy, and Christy will get your answers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. <clears throat> Christy, turning to you. So starting this evening, we have already covered the 2021 local audit presentation. We are also going to review um, some large revenue sources uh, for the current school year. Um, so you can see where we're trending on those and that will be helpful in then preparing for the 22-23 budget. Quickly review the Act 1 index as that has an impact on whether the board will decide um, to do a resolution or develop a preliminary budget and apply for referendum exceptions. And then review the 2023 very draft budget that was put together. And then to also look at salary and benefits. Okay, so our first major revenue source that I wanted to review with you this evening is our current real estate tax. Um, this is um, one of our larger sources that we had been advised by our professional organization that could have been impacted um, by the coronavirus. They were thinking that we could potentially receive less um, real estate tax revenues uh, with possibly people not working during the pandemic. However, that did not happen in um, last fiscal year. And so far for the current fiscal year, we're not seeing an impact um, on our current real estate tax revenues due to the pandemic. So just a really quick overview of how to read the chart. Um, each month um, is represented by a different color. And the current year data, it shows the current year data through December 2021, and then it shows the previous two years for comparison purposes. So for example, you can see that the first three bars represent the, la the current July and the last two Julys. And then that holds the same for the rest of the subsequent months. So you can see that we received the majority of our real estate tax revenues in the month of July through September. And I believe that's because um, July and August are the discount periods where you can receive a slight discount on your tax bill if you pay before the end of August. September and October are our face period where you pay your um, tax bill at the original amount that's produced. And then after that, there is a penalty period for November and December. So all of our current real estate tax revenue is received no later than January of 2021 because that is when we have to uh, close out with the county offices. 
and any tax revenue that's not received by then has to be turned over to the county and then the county um, tries to collect the delinquent real estate tax on our behalf and any revenue that they collect we then record under delinquent revenue. So looking at the actual dollar figures, what does it look like for us? So down below there's a, the chart that shows the cumulative year to date. So when you look at the current fiscal year, we have uh, received in just over 23.7 million in current real estate tax. When you compare that to last year at this time, we had received in 22.2 million. And then the previous year, um, July of 19 through December of 19, we received in 21.3 million. So uh, for comparison purposes, we are 6.62% above where we were at the same time during the previous period. Also, as you can see below, we had budgeted uh, 23.6 million um, in current real estate tax. So we are slightly above that at 23.7 million. Moving on, um, our realty transfer tax was another uh, source of revenue that we were advised could potentially be impacted by the pandemic. Again, we did not see that happen in last fiscal year and we're not seeing that happen in the current fiscal year. So this graph is the same illustration as the previous. Um, each month is a different color bar. Um, we showed current year to date through December and then two previous years for comparison. I just wanted to point out if you don't see anything in the month of July, that's not that we didn't have any transactions that occurred in July, but the way this revenue works is any transactions that occur in the month of July is posted in our system in August. So we lag one month data um, from when we get it to the county to when we can post it in the system. And this holds true for all subsequent months except for May and June. Um, and when you look at the June um, numbers, that includes both transactions that occurred in the month of May and June. So in the current fiscal year, you can see there are two large spikes, one that occurred in August and the other one that occurred in December. So in August of 2021, um, the Kramer Road Warehouse um, in Cumberland County uh, changed ownership hands. And so through that, um, we received um, $271,539 in real estate transfer tax. So that was a very large property tax base that sold, generating that spike in August of 21. And of course, they don't sell every year, so this is like a windfall. This is a one-time windfall. It's not that it'll be something that we can bank on that will reoccur um, each year from year to year. And then the other spike you see is in December of 2021, and that came from two large property sales. One um, was the warehouse in Cumberland County. It was Cephas Park, and it um, transferred ownership to Walnut Owner LLC. That is a warehouse um, across from Vistals. And that warehouse sold for over $164 million, and we received in 823,000 of uh, realty transfer tax for that property. And then um, in Franklin County, there was a parcel that sold of approximately, well actually two parcels together sold for approximately 130 plus acres. It was the Forrester family farm they sold to Matrix. And that tax base was about 1.5 million, which generated um, $7,871. So um, between those three properties, that totals a little over 1.1 million um, that added to our realty transfer tax um, this year. So as you can see down below, our cumulative year to date for this year, we've received in uh, 1.4 million or 466% of where we were last year at this time period. Last year, we had only received in 250,000 and then the year before we had only received in 218,000. And in comparison to our annual budget, we had only budgeted for 450,000. Traditionally, um, I will get into more details as we get into future budget meetings on revenues, 
but I just wanted to say traditionally we see on average um, our realty transfer tax usually comes in anywhere between I'm going to say 400 and 500,000. So the 1.4 million is certainly a windfall in this year and we don't expect that to continue year over year. The last major revenue source um, that again keeping an eye on because uh, we had been advised that through the pandemic our earned income tax may be impacted. Again, we did not see that last year and we are not seeing that as of um, this year so far. So again, this graph follows the same as the three previous graphs. You have current year data uh, through December and then um, you have two, two previous years to compare that with. Um, so when you look at the cumulative year to date, this year so far we received in to approximately 2.6 million in earn, earned income tax. We are about 5% above where we were last year at the same time. So last year we received in about 2.4 million. And the previous year, July 19 of to December of 2019, we received in about 2.3 million. And just so for comparison purposes, um, we had budgeted about five, um, not about, we budgeted 5.2 million um, for this year's budget for total earned income tax. So for some of our new members on the board, I wanted to give um, some background information about the Act 1 index when you hear us talk about that. In 2005, the state passed the Act 1 law, um, which began with the fiscal year July 1 of 2007. And what does that mean? Well, that means um, previously to July 1 of 2007, school districts could raise their um, millage rates to whatever level they needed to cover their budget deficit. And then the state came along and said, no, you can no longer do that, that we are gonna put a max on the amount that you can raise your real estate tax revenue or your millage rates by. So now we have to live in this index that is calculated by PDE. So how does PDE calculate this index? Well, they look at several different things. The base index is calculated by averaging the Pennsylvania statewide average weekly wage and the federal unemployment cost for elementary and secondary schools. So that's how they calculate the base index. And then there is what they call the adjusted Act 1 index. So for any school district that has a market value personal income aid ratio greater than 0.4, the value of their index is adjusted upward by multiplying the base index by the sum of 0.75 and that market value personal income aid ratio for the particular school district. So Shippensburg has always had a market value um, personal income aid ratio above the 0.4. So our um, index has always been adjusted higher than the base. So for comparison purposes, you can see for the current budget year or the current year that we're in for 21-22, our adjusted Act 1 index was 3.9. For the 22-23 budget, our adjusted Act 1 index is 4.5%. Um, or if the board would choose to raise taxes to the index, that would bring in approximately 790000 of additional tax revenue to the district. And just for um, comparison purposes, the base index um, for this year is 3.4. So we were adjusted upward to 4.5%. And just for history, I'm not, I'm not going to go over this entire chart, but I just wanted to provide it to you so you can have the um, Act 1 index base history since 2012-13. And you can see that the um, base index has um, increased slightly year over year. Um, back in 12-13, it was 1.7% uh, was the base index. And like I said, for the 22-23 budget year, um, the base index is 3.4. But again, Shippensburg's is adjusted up to 45 and then the second chart below, um, what I wanted to show there was we were hearing earlier on in the pandemic that the Act 1 index might be negatively impacted um, um, by the pandemic. So what this shows is um, if you go down to the, the bold black line for future budget years for 23-24, you can see that the, um, the base index is rising from 3.4 to 4.3. It's projected to stay at 4.3 for 24-25 and then dip down to 3.6 in 25-26. Again, this is the base index. 
um, which would signify to me, unless for some reason our market value aid ratio would drastically change over the next several years, um, Shippensburg's adjusted Act 1 index will be higher than 4.3 the next two years. Again, I'm not going to focus a lot of time. I just wanted to give um, some history on Shippensburg's um, historical tax increases. Um, I'll just kind of briefly talk about um, this chart and how to read it. So again, this chart goes back to 2004-05. I uh, wanted to show the board what um, the millage rate looked like prior to um, the Act 1, the, the enactment of the Act 1 index. And so you can just see the first column is the year. The second column is our actual, um, what was approved by the board, our actual millage rates for both counties. You can see if the board would have chosen to go to the Act 1 index, what the allowable rate would have been for each of the counties. And then the next two columns show, you know, did we increase taxes to the index? Did we do a partial increase? If there's no X's in either of the columns, that means that there was no tax increase, and that's also reflected in the next column over in the notes section. And then the last two show um, Shippensburg's adjusted Act 1 index in comparison to the base index. Oh, and I just wanted to point out real quickly, if you see a dip um, in from 2010-11 to the 11-12 year, um, Cumberland County's um, millage rate was 13.55, and then it went down to 10.01. And there is an asterisk beside that. That's because the Cumberland County did a countywide reassessment. Okay, so the first major decision that the board will need to make regarding the budget will be at our upcoming board meeting in here in January, January 24th. And what the board's gonna need to decide is, are they gonna do a resolution, which means you're going to live within the adjusted Act 1 index and not raise taxes above the index, or are you gonna go the preliminary budget route and apply for referendum exceptions? So, um, there are four available referendum exceptions, and those are um, for increases in our PEASERS or our retirement contribution. We do not qualify um, for that exception this year. There is also one for special education expenditures. Uh, this year we do qualify for that referendum exception, and the amount is calculated at approximately $1 million. Um, Shippensburg School District is not um, eligible. We do not qualify for the school construction grandfather debt and, and we will never qualify for that one. Um, just real quickly, what that does is if you had incurred any debt, I think it was before 2004, in which your debt structure, um, when you were making your payments, that your payments would actually go up year over year instead of decline, we would be eligible. But unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever you wanna say it, um, our debt service payments were structured that they decline year over year. So we will never qualify for that one. And then the school construction like elect electoral debt, um, the current year we don't qualify. What this is, is if the board would ever decide to do a voter referendum question in order to take on new debt and pay for that by raising taxes above the index, we could potentially qualify for that. But at this point, um, Shippensburg has not ever went to a voter referendum in order to secure new debt. And real quickly, this is very small, but in your package, you also have the worksheets that are a little bit bigger in numbers for you. So PDE provides school districts the worksheets on how to calculate uh, whether or not you uh, qualify for these referendum exceptions. I'm so, sorry, Christy, can I interrupt you real quick? Sure. So, I, so back to page nine, because I think I asked about this before, and, and uh, I, can't, I can't remember what the answer was. But so, um, because in a lot of states, if you're going to build something, then you pass a referendum, you, you know, sort of sell the bonds, whatever, and that's, that's sort of how you do it. And, it. and it sounds like what you're saying is that is an option, but it's just sort of peculiar. It doesn't normally happen in Pennsylvania. And that would be that fourth one. That, that yes, that is correct. Um, uh, when you talk to our um, bond, um, our financial advisors, PFM, 
Um, they say that it, not that it can't be done, but it, it's very challenging for school districts um, to put a ballot question, so a voter referendum question on the ballot, to ask the taxpayers to increase taxes above the index to, to take on additional debt. But conceivably, so it is very rare and it sounds like it's very hard, but it is conceivable that you could say like, hey, we need to build a new high school. You put that question to the public. Do you want to fund this, uh, the debt that it would require for us to build this high school? And, and then you could just sort of put that to the public on the ballot. That, that is correct, but then what this referendum exception does, so you, that's the first thing that would have to happen for us to even be eligible for the electoral debt. And then, um, so you put, say you would, put a voter referendum question out there and, and the community would agree to it. Then you have to, this debt structure, just like I talked about the grandfather debt, if your debt structure would be structured that your payments increase year over year, then you could apply for this. But if, you, if it was structured that our financial advisors have the, the debt payments decreasing year over year, then we wouldn't be eligible for that. Okay. I don't know that you can. Because it's right. We the presentation, um, there, are, there are a couple of outside, outside the door available. In addition, uh, the presentation will be available on the um, agenda manager tomorrow. Thanks, Christy. You're welcome. So not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, this is in your packets, but um, this is set. It's a worksheet provided by PDE as PDE calculates these referendum exceptions. And we have to key in all the areas in green. So again, I'm not going to go over them, but the first one is the retirement contributions. So I plugged in, based on the draft budget, what we believe our salaries to be, what the PEASER's um, retirement contribution rate is going to be, um, what we're projecting our revenue from the state to be for our retirement expenditures, and then our salary base for federal um, employees and then our adjusted Act 1 index, and you can see that it comes up that we do not qualify for the referendum um, exception for the retirement contributions. And then on the right-hand side is the special education expenditure worksheet, and what this compares is it compares um, our 1920 uh, fiscal year to our 2021 fiscal year amounts, and so you can see um, our special education expenditures are increasing under 1A. Total special education expenditures are going from 7.5 million to 8.8 .8 million. And then, um, in, then we add in some additional special education expenditures, um, prorating those. And so our total special education expenditures are going from 8.9 million to about 10.2 million. We put in what um, we received in special education funding from the state put in our adjusted Act 1 index, and you can see that it's calculating that we are eligible for just over a million dollars in additional special, or I should say revenue for our special education expenditures. So, so let me just ask a quick question here to clarify. So how, how would this work then? Because that looks like that's an additional, what, 6% increase in property taxes or something? So like beyond the index. So if we were to go this route, what you're saying is that we could like raise taxes to the index, which is 4.5%, and then go beyond that an additional whatever, you know, 6% is what I'm guessing, to get another million dollars of revenue. Is that how I'm understanding that? That is absolutely correct. Wow, okay. And so later on in the presentation, I have, um, placed in there when we get to like the impact to our taxpayers, it'll show you like if you would go to the index what the millage rate would be and if you go above the index, um, you know, then what would that millage rate look like to get the additional um, $1 million for the special education expenditures. Oh, and I just wanted to point out um, really quickly that um, just because we apply for the referendum exceptions, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to use them. 
but if we don't apply for them and we don't go through the preliminary um, budget process, then, then that door closes on us. So this first decision, um, when it's made, you know, if we live within the Act 1 index or we go the preliminary budget route, just because we went the preliminary budget route does not mean that we have to use the referendum exception. But if we don't do it, we've closed the door and we don't have that available. Sorry, one more question then. So um, does that mean that if you do apply, it is automatically uh, granted? Or is there some like decision maker that decides whether you would get it or not? That is correct. It is, it is not automatically guaranteed. Um, PDE is the decision maker. So they would review that worksheet that you see in front of you, I would have to do online. It would go to PDE and then they would decide if we are truly eligible for this referendum exception. And so that is when I get through the budget resolution or the, the, the two different timelines, you'll see where that comes into play when PDE has to notify us if we are actually approved for that referendum exception. So I have no context for knowing, you know, sort of if these, if, if when these kinds of applications go, are submitted, if, if they're sort of regularly approved or if it's a, you know, some approved like 50% or what? Like, I mean, do you have any sense of how often these kinds of applications are approved? I, I believe, pretty much unless you've keyed in, I think, a number incorrectly or something, I believe that the majority of the time PDE has approved them if okay. you apply. And yeah. I can go out online. If you go out on PDE's website, it'll actually show you the school districts that applied for referendums in the past. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I believe it's a validation of the information that we submit. Oh, okay. So it, so it is kind of automatic as long as you actually qualify. There's not really a judgment call anywhere. I understand. Yes. Okay. Okay, so if we go the resolution time route where you live within the Act 1 index, what the timeline looks for uh, you as a board and, and, and when those decisions need to be made um, is the first timeline in front of you. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I, w I did want to point out a few things. Like um, September 1 is when PDE released the base Act 1 index. And then September 30th, is when they released the adjusted Act 1 index. And on December 30th, um, that is when the county emailed the Homestead Farmstead applications or postcards um, to our residents, which say, you know, if, if, you, if, you, if you want to, you can apply for your primary residence to receive a discount or credit on your tax bill. So if you're not already enrolled in that program and you're interested in doing so, please make sure that you fill out that application if you got an application. If not, if, you're, if your home is already enrolled in the Homestead Farmstead, then you'll get a postcard just saying that you're currently enrolled in that. So then again, uh, we're here tonight to discuss um, the draft budget. And then we are asking for approval from the board whether or not you want to live within the Act 1 index or if you want to go the preliminary budget route and apply for referendum exceptions. The first column you will see, it says there's a key, there's a legend. If there's an X there, that means that it, it indicates um, board involvement. If it's highlighted in green, that means that there needs to be action taken. So the Act 1 timeline that I was speaking of, or the Act 1 index that I was speaking about earlier actually comes with a tight or a, a official deadline where we have to make these decisions by a certain date. So based on the Act 1 timeline, um, the board would have to make the decision no later than January 27th if you were going to do the resolution or the preliminary budget route. So what I tried to do is any time that there was a decision that needed to be made, I tried to incorporate them into a current um, board meeting. Otherwise, if you don't make the decision, at that meeting, just know that we will have to um, schedule special meetings in order to meet the Act 1 deadline. So then, um, if we go the resolution route, then I'll just have to submit the opt-out resolution to PDE that was board approved. And then the next um, timeline that you need to meet in, in accordance with the Act 1 deadline is to approve a proposed final budget. And so that has to be done no later than May 31st 
but we have proposed um, to make that decision at the April 25th board meeting. And then we would have to display the final budget for public inspection by May 24th if it's approved at April 25th. And then we have to put notice of intent in the newspaper that the board will adopt the final budget and what date that will be. And we have listed here um, that the board would approve um, the final budget on June 13th. But again, the latest that they can that you can approve a final budget is June 30th. But again, that would um, cause special board meetings to be held. And if it's approved much later than June 13th, then our tax bills can't go out with a July 1 date on them. Christy, just to add very quickly for the board and our audience, this timeline that Christy just reviewed is what has been the traditional timeline uh, and certainly the timeline that we uh, went through last year. I have another question. <laughs> Keep coming up. I really appreciate this explanation. This is, uh, I don't know, this is year number five and I'm finally figuring this out. Um, uh, I don't, I, I mean, I'm, I don't think anybody here would, uh, could stomach a 10% increase in, in, uh, taxes, but I, I'm still just really curious about this. So if we were to, uh, apply for the referendum exception and get that like extra million dollars, which would be like a 6% increase in tax increases, I, I'm assuming that that doesn't mean a 6% increase in perpetuity but it would only be if we continued to qualify year to year under those same criteria. Like, like if we didn't, like this, we've got this special education thing and under which, under which we would qualify, maybe next year we wouldn't qualify. So presumably the, what we would actually be approving is a short term tax increase but not necessarily in perpetuity. Is that, is that correct? Let me ask, maybe I can ask in a different way, see if it's the same question. Whatever that millage rate, millage increase is, going for the exception, does that stay in every, I be, every year? Yes. Is that basically it? I, I believe it does, and that's how I was gonna explain it. So um, yes, it doesn't mean you're doing a 6% in perpetuity, but it's gonna add to our millage base. So our millage base isn't gonna drop back down. So if, if our millage base becomes, which we'll see it in the impact to the taxpayers, if through the referendum exceptions, just say um, Cumberland County goes up to 13.1 mil, I, I forget what it is in here, then it's gonna stay at that. That's what's gonna be oh, our base millage okay. rate. So it does stay put then, it doesn't go away. You don't have to like sort of demonstrate that you qualify year to year under these kinds of referendum I believe exceptions. I, do, do you know? But I, I, my understanding was that, it, that once you raise that millage rate, that that millage rate would stay. Okay. Interesting. Which, if, if you think about it, kind of makes sense because when you look at the, um, the exception that you were approved for, in this case, special education, those costs aren't going to go down in a year. They're still going to be there. Well, but those special education costs could be uh, influenced by just sort of random chance, right? I mean, you just might happen to have more students that need special education uh, services in, in a particular year or in a series of years, right? Um, you can. I mean, you can have those, those um, cases pop up, but again, um, knowing from year to year, and how do I want to put this? It never goes down. <laughs> it's a, yeah, you know I mean, yeah. It sticks, sticks with um, whatever, wherever you're at, it seems to um, continue on. And, and whatever the special education services that a student, a child is receiving one year carries over to the next, unless for some reason, you know, they were to move um, outside of the district. Okay. So then um, moving on, what does the timeline then look like if you would do the preliminary um, budget and apply for referendum exceptions? So the first three rows are the same as, as the last um, resolution. Again, um, we're having the budget finance meeting tonight. Um, the board would need to approve at the upcoming board meeting whether or not um, you're gonna uh, go the resolution route and live within the Act 1 index, or if you wanna um, do the preliminary budget route develop a preliminary budget and apply for the refer referendum exceptions. So there's a lot more um, steps and meetings that need to occur and decisions that need to occur if um, 
we do the preliminary budget route. So if the board would um, want to move forward with a preliminary budget and apply for the re referendum exceptions, we would have to display a preliminary budget um, to the public on January 25th. Um, we would then have to um, do a notice of intent in the newspaper um, stating when the board would adopt the preliminary budget and apply for referendum exceptions. So we would put something in the paper on February 1st. And then at the February 14th board meeting, that's when you would need to adopt a preliminary budget and authorize to apply for the referendum exceptions. Uh, February 19th, we would then need to submit the preliminary budget to PDE. We would have to, uh, again, in the paper, um, notify the intent to apply for the PDE referendum exceptions. So we would put that in the February 15th News Chronicle. And then March 1st would be the district's deadline to request approval from PDE, those referendum exceptions that we're eligible for. And then March 14th, um, it would be the district's deadline to submit um, the to the primary election a referendum seeking voter approval of a tax increase in access of the index for any request that was denied by PDE or for items beyond the available for referendum exceptions. So again, like the electoral debt, if you wanted to do something like that, that would be have to be a voter referendum. And then um, April 25th, um, again, same as the resolution timeline, we would ask the board to adopt a proposed final budget. We would display that um, for public inspection starting May 24th. We would publish a notice of intent of when the board would approve the uh, final budget um, in the May 31st paper. And then on June 13th, we would ask the board to adopt the final um, 2023 budget. And I just, I thought I had it in the presentation, but let me look quickly because I have the deadline on when PDE has to notify us. So they would have to notify us by March 21st um, if they um, approved our referendum exception. Okay, so to begin looking at a very draft budget, um, starting with revenues, um, what I did to draft the first round of the 2023 revenues um, some of the assumptions that I included in the revenues was I did not um, place a real estate tax increase in the amount. So I showed that amount separately. I used updated assessed values as of January 20, 2022 for both Franklin and Cumberland counties. And I did want to point out that within the assessed values for Franklin County, it does include the full value of the new matrix warehouse located off the I-81 Fayette Street exit. Uh, if you remember when we put the 21-22 budget together, uh, we did bump up our interim real estate taxes because we had heard that that warehouse was to be completed sometime in December. And that did happen. Um, that warehouse went on our tax rolls um, as of January. So we will be getting interim real estate tax on that property from January to June. And just um, for information purposes, um, based on our current tax rate, um, that warehouse went on our books at a value of 800, or I'm sorry, 8,897,650. So that's the assessed value of that property. Based on our 2021-22 millage rate for Franklin County, that's at full revenue, $859,066. So, um, with no tax increase, um, that would be the amount of additional revenue that will be in the 22-23 budget. So I did include that. I used the updated um, market values um, from the state. Uh, last year, we bumped up the collection rate, or for the current year, we bumped up the collection rate from 94 to 95%. It looks like we're trending just above a 95% collection rate. So for the 2022-23 budget, I left it at 95%. Uh, we have one LERTA that remains on the books, so that was included in our um, current real estate tax revenue. 
I updated the Social Security and Retirement Revenue subsidies to correspond with the budgeted Social Security and Retirement expenditures. And I did update some of the following revenue accounts based on historical or other available information at this point. So I did make an adjustment to interim real estate tax um, per capita, our local services tax, our earned income tax, delinquent tax, and debt service reimbursement, and to our federal grants. And then all other revenues I budgeted flat from 21-22 at this point. Christy, I have a couple of questions. One, your, re your, assumption, your revenue assumptions for the budget always include a state subsidy level funding, correct? That and is, yeah, that is correct. we most of the time don't even know what the state subsidy will be when we pass the final budget in June, correct? Correct. A lot of times the state budget has not passed. And state subsidy, okay, so then if the state provides an increase, and let's use an example of $300,000, when that comes in, that goes into the fund balance. For that year, and then what we do is we, we increase the following year's budget to reflect that amount. So okay. that is exactly what we did from in 21, 22, uh, we left it, it flat for that budget, but we actually got an additional revenue. So that additional revenue is now reflected in the 22, 23 budget. Okay, so the state subsidy is meant for recurring expenses. So that's just going into the next budget and not just sitting in fund balance. Correct. Okay, that was my question, thank you. You're welcome. So for tonight's purposes, um, I just did a high-level summary of our revenues based on the clusters of revenues that we receive. Um, I will get into more details later on the revenue side, but for tonight, I'm showing it as total amount of local revenues received, total amount of state revenues, and total federal revenues. And just for a quick summary tonight, you can see below what local revenues, it's not all inclusive, but I hit, hit the highlights of what our local revenues include what our state revenues include and what our federal revenues include. I also gave you the prior two budget years to compare to. So you can see for 22-23, at this point, we are budgeting total revenues at just over 56.6 million, or approximately a $1 million increase over the 21-22 budget amount. And again, that 56.6 million does not include any real estate tax increase. So, you know, if we increase taxes to the index, that's an additional approximately 790,000. If you would apply for the referendum exceptions, that amount is just over a million dollars. So combined, if you did both, that would be uh, just over 1.7 million total that could be added to the revenues. So then the only revenue that I thought I would kind of hone in more tonight on was our real estate tax revenue because it is the most complex and that is um, what's driving this decision that needs to be made at the upcoming meeting of whether or not you're going to um, increase taxes above the index. So the real estate tax revenue is, is, takes into account um, many different factors. First of all, to come up with our um, revenue, you have to take into account what we believe our collection rate to be. And then it looks at the assessed values per county. And then it takes into account your market value percentages per county. And then it, by that, it, the system comes up with what our millage rate will be for each county. I won't um, go over the information, but you can see there, um, you know, the market value um, percentages change from year to year. So you can see Cumberland County goes down slightly and Franklin County goes up slightly. And if um, there's no tax increase at all, you can see that Cumberland County's um, um, millage rate is impacted. It's gonna go up slightly, and Franklin County's is gonna go down slightly. So included in our current real estate tax revenue are our LERDAs. And previously we had two LERDAs. We have a LERDA on our Procter & Gamble property um, that's located in Franklin County. And it is a 10-year LERDA. It goes through 25-26 um, fiscal year. So we have several years left on that LERDA. And each year we get an additional 10%. So 
So what does that 10% equate to? That equates to just over, or just under, I should say, $75,000 of additional revenue to our budget. So that amount is included in the revenues. We did have another LERDA um, in Cumberland County on the Cephas Park Warehouse, but that actually concluded in the current fiscal year in 21-22. So going forward, um, that warehouse is shown on the books at the full uh, value. So if there is no tax increase at all, what does that look like to our taxpayers? So you can see up in the top box what our current millage rate is for Cumberland and Franklin counties. If there's no tax increase, you can see what those rates are projected to be. So what does that mean for our taxpayers? There are several scenarios listed below, um, just so you can see a, a range. But I highlight in yellow the median assessed value per county. So looking at Cumberland County, if there's no tax increase, what does that mean? That means that the, any resident in Cumberland County with a median assessed value property at 170,700 assessed value, their annual tax bill is gonna go up by about $28.93, or a per month cost of $2.41. On the Franklin County side, again, if there's no tax increase, and based on a median assessed value property at 19,340, um, they would actually see their annual tax bill go down by about $43.22, or on average, a decrease of $3.60. If the board would choose to um, increase taxes to the index, again, the millage rates are listed there at the top of the slide, what would that mean for our Cumberland County residents? So again, just looking at the median assessed value, their annual tax bill would go up $92.72. But keep in mind that if you do nothing and you do not increase taxes to the index, their, the Cumberland County residents tax bill is gonna go up by $28.93. So that is all inclusive in that number. So really the, the difference would be $63.79 of what their tax bill would increase by if you go to the index. Um, and then for Franklin County, um, if you would go to the index, um, their um, total tax bill, again, median assessed value, they would see an increase of $12.45 instead of the decrease of $40 and, I forget what that was, let me back up to the slide, uh, $43.22. And then if you would go to the index and apply for the referendum exceptions, um, what does that look like? Again, the millage rates are listed at the top of the page for each of the counties. Again, focusing in on the median assessed of value of um, 170,700 in Cumberland County, their annual tax bill would go up $180.36. Again, that's inclusive if there's, if there's no tax increase at all. Cumberland County's bill is gonna go up $28.93 anyway. So that's a net difference of 151.43. Um, but based on the $180.36, that would be a per month cost of $15.03. And on the Franklin County side, again, if you go to the index and apply for referendum exceptions, they would see on the median assessed value property, their annual cost would go up $74.87 or approximately $6.24 a month. Christy, just a real quick question going back to slide 19. Um, you noted in Franklin County, if the board were to choose to go to the index, that that would be a $12.45 increase. And I guess my question is just to clarify, is that is that a $12.45 increase or is that the adjusted assessed value minus $12.45? So in other words, on page 18, it's showing Franklin County with no change would see a $43.22 increase does it just modify that to a $30.70 um, decrease? So, so instead of, yes, having a savings of $43, or whatever that was, $43. Um, the, the net difference taking into account that $12 mm -hmm. and $4.45. Okay. 
So I'll say, and I just want to clarify this to say it another way. If the board chose to implement a tax increase, an, an increase to the index, what that would mean for Franklin County, again, median assessed value home, is that their taxes would go down $30.77. Like say that again. If the board increased taxes to the index for a median assessed value home in Franklin County, they would see their cost go down $30.77? No, they, they would actually still see it go up. Because if you look at the, the, the millage rates, mm -hmm. Um, for a tax increase to the index, their current rate is 96.5498, mm -hmm. and going to the index would be 97.1937. So they would actually be paying a okay. little bit more than they were last year. Okay, thank which, you. Which is essentially flat. If we, if we, if we take the same discussion and, 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 and say if, if, the, if the board chooses to raise taxes to the index, which is 4.5%, the adjusted Act 1 index, because of the STEB market value uh, analysis, which stands for State Tax Equalization Board, what, what that really means, I, I believe, is that we would assign the, the 4.5 to Cumberland County and essentially let Franklin County float. And so that's the that's spelled out in the difference in millage rates in Cumberland County from 12.0731 to 12.6163. That's 4.4 uh, that's or whatever. And then as Franklin County floats, that's that 96.5498 to 97.1937, which is essentially flat. Is that right? That's correct. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to our expenditure assumptions. Um, for our personnel expenditures, we included any known increases, or when there wasn't any known increases, then we um, included some estimates. For the non-personnel expenditures, um, the projections include um, mainly flat budget amounts from the 21-22 year, except if I am aware of any large adjustments that needed to be made to expenditures, I included them. And one of them um, that has been increasing over the last few years are our cyber charter school expenditures and our substitute prof professional expenditures. So pre-pandemic, um, our cyber charter school expenditures was just right around one million. Currently, um, we are over 2.7 million in cyber charter school expenditures. And I will get into more details in an upcoming budget meeting and show the details behind that, how many students and, and all that. But I just wanted to point that out for this evening, that that is a very large amount that I went ahead and um, increased those budget projections for those costs. So in high level, again, in future budget meetings, we'll start to break these categories down and look at them in more in, more, more in depth. But for tonight, I broke our, our expenditures down by objects. So you can see them on the screen. That includes salary, benefits, professional and technical services, uh, purchase property services, other purchase services, which include transportation, travel, supplies, property equipment, other, um, what they deem as other objects, PDE, dues, fees, and the 900 um, other uses of funds, which is our debt service. So again, you, I provided you the last two budget years for comparison purposes and what we are projecting at this point, which is very preliminary, for the 22-23 budget. And I won't go down over every line item, but as you can see, um, we are projecting expenditures to be just over 59.2 million. Um, last year, or current year that we're sitting in, our budget was 56.8 million or an increase of over $2.4 million. And you can see at this point where those increases are expected to be, mainly in salary and benefits. So then what does that look like in summary? So our revenues with no tax increase um, is 56.6 million. That's what we're projecting at this point. Our expenditures right now are being projected at 59.2 million which would leave us at a deficit of just over, or just under 2.6 million. 
If the board would choose to raise taxes to the index, that would be an additional $790,000. Um, we technically each year, if our PISER's um, retirement contribution rate is going up, we put that amount in and it, it, is, it is going up again this year. So we put in um, $78,465 out of fund balance to help cover the increase in the PISER's contribution rate which would bring us down to a revised uh, deficit of 1.7 million. Keep in mind, I don't have on this slide, but if you would apply for the referendum exceptions for the special education, that was just over $1 million. Um, if you would take that into account, then that would bring our deficit down um, to just over $700,000. $700, and again, what I wanted to point out at this slide, a couple things um, I don't have on the slide, but last year at this time when we met, um, we were looking at a surplus deficit um, prior to any tax revenue increases of just over 5.7 million. So we're only looking at 2.6 million this year. And um, our revised deficit last year, we were looking at a deficit of four, approximately 4.4 million. Again, I will just wanted to point out our cyber charter school expenditures pre-pandemic was just over $1 million. Uh, we had about 80 students enrolled in cyber charter schools. Currently, we have over 180 students enrolled in cyber charter schools, which puts our current cost at 2.7 million. So if we could work to get our cyber charter schools um, down to pre-pandemic levels, there would be approximately 1.7 million that we could pull out of our expenditures. I also wanted to point out, please keep in mind, that um, we receive ESSER funds for the next two budget years, 22-23 and 23-24. And part of the ESSER budget, we included 4.5 existing teaching positions of approximately $466,000 in expenses that we will need to eventually work back into the budget as those federal funds go away. And we also had budgeted for, I think, five temporary ESSER positions and I'm sure some of those positions would like to be kept as well. Um, and so just as a quick estimate, five temporary positions would be about a half a million dollars. So in terms of salaries, um, again, where we could, I included all known um, increases. Um, I included all current permanent positions, both filled and unfilled. Um, we, um, there are, um, Act 93 and support staff increases are to be determined as those agreements will need to be um, hashed out. Um, so our salary differences um, from last year to this year is just under 1.5 million. And again, that includes a number of new positions. Um, we had added, um, I wrote down two, eight special ed positions we added. Um, we have four um, ESSER positions and we had added two sixth grade positions at the beginning this year, as well as um, several um, classroom assistants. So all those are included in the salary numbers. So moving on to benefits, um, each year, uh, PEASERS has to certify their employer contribution rate. And for historical purposes, I provided um, back to 2011-12. So you can see in 11-12, the rate was only 8.65%. And over the last several years, that PEASERS contribution rate has increased significantly. It has leveled off, but it is still high and still increasing. So for 21-22, our PEASERS employer contribution rate is 34.94% or budgeted amount, we have approximately 7.9 budgeted for that expense. In 22-23, the PSERS employer contribution rate is gonna go up to 35.26% or approximately 8.6 million in expenditures budgeted. <coughs> for um, medical benefits, um, we have received a preliminary projection from our consortium of what our medical expenditures may increase by. So we put an additional 6.5% increase in our budget for medical expenditures. I'm not sure um, where our other healthcare expenditures may go. 
in terms of dental and vision, but I did include a small increase in those as well. I have updated our Social Security retirement and workers' compensation costs based on our projected salaries. And then I mainly kept all other benefits flat um, from the current year into the 22-23 draft budget. So looking at benefits, breaking this down by object code, you can see um, our benefits include medical insurance, dental insurance, life, um, income, um, or long-term disability, um, vision, social security retirement, tuition reimbursement, unemployment compensation, workers' compensation, um, our contribution into the HSAs and HRAs, and then the other benefits for clearance reimbursement. And I did notice when I put this together that I did not project anything in the 22-23 budget for clearance reimbursement, so I will need to go back and look. If we are trending around that 9,000, I will need to include something um, later on in the 2023 budget for that. But in total, um, for our benefits, uh, we are budgeting at this point 16.8 million for our benefit cost compared to last year at 15.6 million or an increase of approximately 1.2 million. And you can see where those increases, the, the majority of our increases are coming from is um, increases in our medical insurance, increases in our social security, um, and increases in our retirement expenditures. So that brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, before I open it up for board questions and discussions, I'll just say that we have tentatively set the following budget and finance committee meeting aside. Um, so we have one that we set aside for February 10th, March 7th, March 21st, April 13th, and May 16th, with having those meetings to begin at 6 p.m. At this point, I will open up if there's any board questions or discussions. I have just one. Um, Mr. Scott, at the last meeting, he's not here tonight, but Mr. Scott brought up several positions, assistant superintendent, resource officer, grant writer. When we look at the $1.7 million deficit that is projected right now, if the taxes are raised to the index, that does not include any new positions, correct? That is correct. And um, we had asked that the building budgets um, that they were due today to my office. So of course we will need some time, Dr. Supp and I would need some time to go through those. But as part of the budget process, we also asked the buildings if they have any personnel requests. So again, we will be bringing that information to you at an upcoming board meeting of what those requests were. And of course, as the, at the board's direction, we will have those prioritized. And each budget finance committee meeting, these numbers get adjusted more and more. Um, but again, the, the administration hasn't provided the list of positions that they would like to have yet. That is correct. So those positions are not included in the $1.7 million. Thank That's you. correct. Well, and, and just to follow up on that, um, I, uh, I, I agree with the assessment, um, but uh, I, I believe from slide 23, what, what another way to say it is, is that, is that um, prior to a tax increase or, or without a tax increase, and, and while we realize this is a very early preliminary budget, which will be refined as we move forward, both in revenue and expenses, that, that uh, the preliminary deficit is actually sitting at $2.6 million. Um, and, and it would, it would take the, uh, the, the full Act I index uh, tax increase um, and, and a little bit from fund balance uh, for Peacer's contribution to, to, to get down to $1.7 million uh, still in deficit, correct? That is correct. Now, just to, just to follow a little further, uh, on page 22, um, I see in item 900, uh, $3.7 million, and uh, that says debt service. Is, is all that, is that the debt service number, 3.7? 3, $3,716,380, $3, is that all? projected debt service. No, that, that's just one of the examples of what is included in the 900 category. So uh, other things that are included in the 900 category is um, our athletic funds are separate from the general fund. 
So when the athletics provide us with their budgets and we have to transfer money from the general fund into the athletic fund, that is also included in the 900 category. So what would the, um, do you have the, the debt service number component of that line item? I don't have it with me this evening. Okay, we've, we've been talking about uh, something, a number like 3.2. Is that close? Uh, 3.4 maybe, um, but yeah, somewhere in that. Okay, 3.2, 3.4, close enough for now. N now, uh, I noticed in the, in the Boyer and Ritter presentation on page 50, uh, it shows principal and interest for 2022 of 1.2 million. Is, is that... Is that about the the uh, correct current required debt service, 1.2? Yes, because if you remember, our debt service dropped off substantially over the last several years, but we have been budgeting um, level debt service from the 1920 school year um, in order to keep that money available to be able to borrow for those future projects. Right. So, so, and that's that's exactly exactly where I was going. And I'm not trying to draw any conclusion of we should do this or we should do that. It's an understanding of the numbers. So, so essentially, the 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 this this two point six million dollar deficit includes either three point two or three point four of debt service that 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 where we really only require if we if we do nothing if we stay as is uh, an expenditure of about 1.2 which means which means somewhere in the range of 1.8 to 2 million dollars of additional debt service uh, in in this budget uh, to to cover the the debt service for the whatever it is approximately 50 million dollars of borrowing but for the projects, is, is that about right? That is correct. And that is one thing that we will delve into more details at an upcoming budget finance meeting. I will go over our debt service and show what the actual payments are versus where we're trying to keep it level debt service from two years ago when it dropped off significantly so we could hopefully continue to borrow to do these larger projects. And, and when that gets budgeted but not spent, that just flows through into fund balance. That is correct. So, could we at same? Would we be able to get a look at what all the status of all the fund balances, maybe at the same time? Because I think they dovetail a lot. Yes, um, that is also usually we look at debt service and fund balance at the same budget and finance okay. committee meeting. Just along those veins, real quick, if I have ten million dollars debt service, sort of current interest rates. Sort of roughly, what is the, what is, or if I have ten million dollars of debt, what is the debt service, the annual debt service on that ten million dollars? Is that about three hundred thousand dollars? Is that right? Um, no, I think it's more like one point, like two, one point three million. Uh, on ten million dollars, I'm paying one point one each year. I don't think that's, uh, that seems a little Maybe high. not. I don't know. I don't have that number with me, so I, I don't, I'm not going to say. I was just trying to go by the audit financial statements, but. And, that would, and obviously it would depend on the interest rate. Right. Well, well, right, but I'm just, I mean, this current $10 million that we just approved, right, we just bought $10 million and we have interest rates more or less locked down, so I'm just curious what, what the annual debt service on that, and I know it's not, or at least I don't think it's flat year to year, but it seemed like it was about $300,000 a year. Yeah, I don't have that with me. Does anyone if, else? if I did it right, when I extrapolated the, the cost of, of 6.5 uh, for the stadium, I got 400000 a year, if, if I did it right, which, which means the, the 10 would be something like uh, six, a little over 600. I can certainly yeah, address wait, that when we look at the debt service. In the audit report, it's got 9.9 .9 as our total debt right now, or as of June 30th, 2021. Correct. I guess what, what, what I want to have in my mind, right, is we, 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 we've talked about this $48 million 
dollars that we could potentially borrow, 10 of which we already have committed. In my mind, I'm trying to weigh money not borrowed that could potentially be used for annual expenditures. Right, so I'm trying to weigh a potential capital project against the possibility of using money for you know annual ongoing expenses, like hiring a new teacher or something. So I, I'm just trying to make sure that we sort of have that in our head, or at least I mean I'm trying to make sure that I have it in my head what the what the trade off is. Sure, I um, that was. Possibly one of the topics that will be at the next budget finance meeting, um, if we stay kind of consistent with what we've the topics that we've done before the next budget finance meeting, we talked about debt service. So I can certainly bring those numbers with okay. me. Okay, great, thanks. Any other questions? Well, I, I would just just like to make a, a comment to, to dovetail to, to Dr. Goat's uh, question or comment. I think that really I think that really is is the the dance, so to speak, uh, it it is it is looking looking at the budget, uh, look which is in deficit, and and it it won't get out of deficit, um, it w without you know without some help. Uh, it, we're talking about possibly a tax increase, we're we're, we're yeah, or or looking at or, or looking at some reduction somewhere, uh, and, and then there's the then then there's the uh, facilities and athletic needs. Uh, and and and, uh, if, and and that's a 20-year lookout, and we need to we need to address those needs, and uh, and so forth. But but they all, as we discussed in the last meeting, they all put pressure uh, on the budget, um, which is already underwater. So so this really is a prioritization of and, and a balancing act. And I certainly don't um, pretend to have the, the the perfect answer, but but I, I do understand that. Um, that, that it is it's complicated it will it will be a prioritization and a balancing uh, b because we we do have and and he here's the proof we do have financial constraints thank you is um, one of the things Mr. President, we would need from tonight is some indication of direction from the board as it relates to the Act 1 index and how we might proceed in preparation for our January 24th meeting. So what do you want? Uh, <laughs> uh, if the board would look back to, and give me a second, I'll find well, the we have Well, we have that. What do you want? Do you want a budget finance committee vote? Well, what, what do you need? I, I don't know that we need a vote. Um, we need we need an indication from the board tonight on where they feel we should be um, as we look at the uh, the index. So the question is whether we want to try to to keep the window open on that on that referendum, right? Well, yeah, and, and and what the implications of that are on the January twenty fourth meeting. Um, it's how we would word the resolution. And then the second part of that is then the timeline being much more aggressive if the board, if there is interest from the board to seek out that exemption that we qualify for special education, then there's a, there's a more aggressive timeline that we need to follow for the, for the budget process. Well, I, I would just, I would say this. Uh, to, to my knowledge, we, we've, in, in, in some years, we didn't really qualify for any exceptions. In some years where we qualified for exceptions, the numbers were, were relatively smaller than this. Certainly, not, I've not seen anything like the potential for $1.1 million. That being said, we, we, we've never done this either. We've never, uh, we've never gone to referendum. Uh, or, or applied for exceptions that would go to referendum, and, and I'm, I'm not really a fan of that. The, the other thing is I did the, I did the math, and Dr. Goetz, you were right, at 6.1% additional, which would be a tax increase of 10.7%. Uh, 
I, I really, I, I really, um, I don't think so. So I, I, you know, I think my 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 idea would be that that we would pass the resolution to to work within the index like we always have. Thank you. I agree, Dwayne. I agree. There's no way I could ever put that a burden. I mean, I, yeah, I'm inclined to agree as well. But I also am sort of puzzled. I mean, you look at this, you know, special education line item on the worksheet that you gave us. And in you know, uh, 1920, we're talking 7.6 million, and then it goes up to 8.9 million. Well, that's a huge jump. What is that, uh, almost 15% increase in our special education expenses? Uh, it seems pretty substantial. Do we have a sense of why such a significant increase? And and. I mean, I get it. I don't want to do a 10% increase either, but like I, what we're just saying, we're just going to absorb that. It's a massive amount to just sort of absorb with the general, with the, the sort of normal increases in revenue. Mr. Goetz, as we, as we, or Dr. Goetz, excuse me, as we proceed through the budget process, um, we, we will look in more detail at specific budget categories. I can say in a general sense, one thing, if you recall last year through the budget presentation, um, there were, there, were, there were a number of items that were sort of miscategorized um, that were special ed expenditures. So we brought, that, we brought that, those numbers over to have a better representation of total um, special education expenditure costs. And then there was a ref, uh, some reformatting regarding um, the programs that we offer and some additional uh, positions as well. So I'm sure that plays a part in it. Um, there are, uh, again, a number of other factors where you're going to see some increases or you can't control um, some increases that might occur with outside placements and things of that nature. So I think we can do um, at a future meeting a little bit deeper dive uh, because you're right, it is a bigger, it is a big number. But I just wanted to uh, at least bring up those two points with regard to the budget preparation for last year. Well, that, that's interesting. So if some of it might just be a sort of administrative reshuffling then, I guess is what I'm hearing of, of budget some, items. Some of that, yes. Some of that. But I, I mean, the reason why I bring up the question is that, you know, we're, we're supposed to make a decision on Monday about, you know, this referendum business, but we don't really have the full picture on what the referendum would supposedly be funding. So I don't know, even though I can't imagine sort of, you know, Supporting that massive increase in taxes, I, I still don't feel like I, you know, am in a place to make an informed decision. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? Any other, other questions? Board, other board members, any comments? Okay, hearing no other questions, is there a motion to adjourn the Budget Finance Committee meeting? Move to adjourn.